Welcome. I'm Dr. Frank Connor. I'm the chair of the psychology department here at Grand Rapids Community College, and I am always so grateful to see a group of students and community members who come to what is this presentation, the third of this year's psychology department speaker series in the first of the second semester. It's my pleasure to introduce to you today our speaker, uh, Dr. Leon Liu. Dr. Liu is an associate professor at Grand Valley State University in the psychology department. Dr. Liu uh, received his bachelor's degree from Fudan University in China, his master's in the, from the Institute of Psychology at the Chi Chinese Academy of Science, and his PhD is from the University of California at San Diego. Please welcome today's speaker. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a psychologist uh, by training, um, but I'm also very interested uh, in painting and uh, drawing. And so that's, uh, I think that's, uh, that's a perfect uh, topic for someone like me to talk about. <laughs> okay. And uh, so I, I love art, and I, I think uh, most people also care and uh, love art. Do you know what is uh, the occasion that this photo was shot? Art Prize. <laughs> yeah, it's Art Prize. And uh, um, yeah, Grand Rapids uh, has become a very artsy place. Okay, people just uh, love art. And uh, such a large crowd okay, just shows that uh, how much people care about art. Uh, if you, if you have, um, if you're not persuaded, you just go to Art Prize this year and you'll be convinced. <laughs> um, well, there are, there are many different kinds of art. Two D, three D, time based. That, that's the category I got from the TV uh, last year. Um, there's a, a discussion of different uh, arts uh, uh, in art price. Okay, these are some of the categories. Okay, and uh, there are representational art, abstract art. Um, but most relevant to this topic uh, is a form of uh, uh, two-dimensional art called uh, observational drawing and uh, painting. And uh, I'm particularly interested in this because it seems to form a pretty good contrast uh, with photography. In photography, uh, you will have to use uh, the camera okay, to okay, basically see things uh, through the lens of the camera. Okay? Um, and in the case of a painting and a drawing, observational painting and a drawing, you have to uh, see with your eyes and uh, without relying on the lens, the optical devices. And uh, you can argue that's also the foundational um, form of art. Okay, that's the f okay, for any image making, the foundation for any forms of image, image making. By the way, in the Western tradition, uh, there is a clear distinction between drawing and a painting. And uh, uh, you, if you would like to cover both drawing and the painting, you would have to say something like a visual depiction, which is a sort of uh, a little bit awkward. But in Chinese, uh, there is a single okay, word, a Chinese character, which covers both drawing and the painting. It's called hua. Okay, literally means picturing. Okay, um, probably this because uh, in the Chinese tradition, okay, there is really not much a difference between okay, drawing with lines and the painting. Okay, painting also. Okay, it's traditionally executed with a brush. It's also lines. Okay. Um, and uh, in Chinese, okay, hua jia basically means, uh, uh, literally means a picturing professional or fine artist in, in English. Um, okay, so human beings have been doing visual art for a long time. Um, and uh, there is uh, a, a um, a great expansion of all forms of visual art, starting from uh, cave paintings uh, uh, in prehistory to, um, to modern art. Okay. 
and, and one, one pinnacle you, you can argue, argue that modern art is the Impressionism, uh, where the uh, there's, uh, there's so much sophistication in understanding the, the shades of a color and the form. Uh, um, so it's interesting to, to, to understand what really um, constitutes the, the printer and the drawer's expertise. Well, you can argue that uh, a lot depends a lot depends on the knowledge of uh, the media that you first have to know the, the paint and the media like a canvas or the paper, the quality of the of, of the um, the texture of the paper. Um, that's definitely true. Okay? It may also depend a lot on motor skill. Um, but motor skill may not be as important as uh, um, as the motor skills are required, for example, in playing a musical instrument. Okay. Um, a lot of the paintings can be done okay, slowly. Okay. I heard that uh, the famous painter Lucien Freud okay, took like uh, uh, more than 20 sessions just to paint a figure painting from model. Okay. And, uh, and you can scratch the, the painter and do it again. Anyway, the motor skill is, uh, is not very important. <laughs> but okay, you may argue otherwise. But Okay, but my, my point is that the most important part of uh, the expertise is actually in the perceptual domain, okay, how these people perceive things. Now, um, many of us who have done some kind of a painting and a drawing okay, have this intuition that we artists see things differently. Um, and this is a famous quote from John Rushkin, a, a British, famous British uh, uh, art educator and also a social activist. According to him, the whole tactical power of a painting depends on our recovery of what might be called the innocence of an eye. That is to say, of a sort of a childish perception of those flat stains of a color, merely as such without consciousness of what's, what they signify as a blind man would see them if suddenly gifted with sight. Actually, we don't know exactly what a blind man suddenly recovered from sight uh, recovered uh, would see. But, but it's the main point, that the artists need to see the raw sensations, the images, rather than the object. Okay. And similarly, okay, the very famous uh, uh, painter a crow, which uh, is commonly considered to be uh, the, the, the painter who inspired uh, the, the, the next generation of impressionist painters like Monet and, uh, and many others. Okay. Um, detach yourself completely from what you know and just paint what you see. Right? That's uh, another famous quote from Monet. Okay. Try to forget what objects that you have in front of you, a tree, a house, a field, or whatever. Merely think here's uh, a little square of a blue here. Here's an oblong of pink and a streak of yellow. And paint just as it appears and exact the color and the shape. Now, when you think about it, okay, this all makes a lot of sense. But the problem is that it does not square very well with the science of visual <laughs> perception. Okay. Why? Well, the basic tenets of uh, modern visual perception science, okay, there, there is actually a whole area called a visual science. Um, it's the study of how we see things. If, uh, and, and it has uh, advanced a lot in the last, just last 30 years. And from, uh, from, uh, from the scientific studies of visual perception, we know, first of all, very obviously, that we see things not just with eyes. We see things with eyes and a brain, <laughs> the visual system. Okay. And second, okay, seeing is, first of all, concerned with objects in the environment rather than the images. If you're not an artist, you go around in the environment, 
Okay, maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it should get better. Yeah. If you're not an artist, you go around in, the, um, in, a, in, a, in a visual environment. What, what is the main thing you want to uh, do? Well, you, you sh uh, I think the main thing is uh, to avoid the bumping into things and, uh, and then stumble, <laughs> right? Okay, you want to see object rather than okay, okay, to see the image and then paint it. Okay, painting is not essential for survival. <laughs> um, And the third point is that the seeing is not like uh, uh, what common sense tells us uh, is uh, about getting the image. Seeing is about seeing involves interpretation, and even image, uh, as I will tell you later, involves in interpretation. It's constructed rather than projected. And here is a philosophical experiment that you can you can do it just in your head. Okay, if uh, uh, if what we see is an image, it's just an image, a projected image in your head, then it does not explain things much. Okay? If it's just an image, then you will need a small man, a so-called homunculus, uh, sitting somewhere in your head and watching this uh, um, projected screen okay, in your head. Well, this picture in your head is just like a photo held in your hand. Okay, you still need a person to understand it. Okay, that just does not explain things. And to explain things, then you will have to conceive a homunculus sitting in the head of this homunculus and watching a smaller scale projection and so on and so forth. It's just absurd. <laughs> um, so it's just not impossible that, that, that you have an, uh, a sort of a biological screen in your head. Okay, every okay, thing is essentially about understanding. It's just a particular kind of understanding. It's a visual understanding of things. Okay, it involves interpretation. And it depends on what kind of visual information that you're, 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 you're interested in you're trying to get. Okay. Um, it's handled by different part of the brain. Okay, that's what modern visual science tells us. Okay. Um, this is a brain. Okay, and your eye is uh, somewhere here. Okay, strangely, all the visual information has to be uh, relayed from the eye to the back of your brain <laughs> to get the processed. That's the back of your brain. That's the, that's the primary visual cortex. Okay, and uh, these are some of the other visual cortex, the higher visual area. And uh, a, a main uh, consensus among the visual science community is that uh, there are two subdivisions of the visual system, the so-called ventral stream and the dorsal stream. Okay? And the ventral stream, oh, sorry. The ventral stream is uh, responsible for recognition, recognition, like uh, um, recognition that this is a chair rather than a table and so on. Okay? And uh, um, the dorsal stream okay, is responsible for uh, for, for, for knowing, okay, visually knowing. Oh, sorry. Oh. oh you have a preview of my. <laughs> yeah, so the, the dorsal string okay, has to do with the location, the ventral string has to do with. Uh, with the identity of the object. Okay. And uh, within the ventral stream, okay, the um, information processing has to go on through multiple stages. Um, you start from a retinal image or the input image, and, uh, and the next stage will be a sort of primal sketch, which is uh, the theory uh, by David Meyer, a very influential neurophysiologist uh, who has uh, a computational theory of vision. So his idea is that uh, this internal process is very much like a drawing, okay, except it's unconscious drawing by the brain. Um, you start from the retinal image. Retinal image is just an image at the back of your eye. 
uh, it's an image of uh, uh, neuronal firing. Okay? So it's basically a distribution of, uh, uh, of light intensities uh, converted into neuronal activities. Um, uh, this, uh, this retinal image is just a biological picture. You're not consciously aware of, the, of your retinal image. The retinal image is absolutely the beginning of visual information processing. It has to go through a series of uh, interpretation and a process and ultimately reach the stage where you have uh, a uh, 3D representation or 3D model of the things that's in front of your eye. Okay? And uh, two of the intermediate stages uh, are these, okay, edge image, okay, which is like a line drawing, except uh, you are not aware of it. It's just uh, um, something inferred from scientific studies. Okay? And then the, the so-called uh, two and a half dimensional uh, sketch, which is a sort of a brain sketch of a surface. Okay? You can think of it as uh, a, represent, a, a, a relief-like uh, representation of the scene the scene in front of you, okay? and the scene is different from the 3D object. It's just, uh, um, it, it, it has a three-dimensional feel, but not exactly three-dimensional, because it's uh, relative to your particular perspective or view. All right? okay. But uh, as I said, ultimately, okay, um, according to these scientists, the purpose of a vision is to see the object the 3D object, or you don't see it directly, you build a mental model of this object. Now, um, if you understand this uh, scientific perspective, then think about the scientist's intuition that we, we should also be able to see images, just to see the raw sensations, then, then it, it just seems that something is not explained in this model. Okay. Um, of course, we see images, um, but, uh, um, but the scientists also told us that the, that the main purpose of vision is to see objects. And, uh, and that's why, okay, it, 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 that's why um, we actually okay, have all sorts of uh, the so-called object bias in perceiving images. Okay. All sorts of biases uh, due to the fact that the primary purpose of vision is seeing object. I'll give you some examples. Okay. First of all, okay, um, how we see an angle. Okay, angle huh? So here is an, uh, a, a picture. Okay. And uh, there are some 3D objects. Okay. And uh, um, let me ask you this. Okay. What degrees of uh, angle does this look like? To you, it's a 90 degrees uh, right angle, right? Okay. What about this one? 90 degrees again? Yeah. Some artist uh, in <laughs> here yeah, okay, definitely are shaking hands, but it, it looks like uh, okay, 80 degrees, I mean, smaller than 90 degrees, right? <laughs> okay. Remember, I'm asking you about the, the angle of this image rather than the object. Okay. And what about this one? Does it look like a right angle, 90 degrees? No, it looks like maybe, I don't know, 95, maybe, maybe 100, maybe 110 degrees. Okay. But actually, they're all 90 degrees. Is that amazing? Okay. <laughs> 90 degrees. These, uh, these, uh, yeah, these uh, black angles uh, uh, are all the same. I just uh, uh, made them okay, by copy and paste. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so object object bias on perceiving angles. Okay. And here's an example: object bias in perceiving shape. Okay. Now these are two different tables, but, I, but that's not what I'm asking you now. Okay. I'm asking you how you perceive. Uh, the shape of this image. It just this looks like a parallelogram, okay, another parallelogram, but, okay, but this looks like uh, um, the horizontal and the vertical dimensions are, are, are a lot similar than this one. Do you agree? This looks slimmer than this. This looks fatter. Okay. Okay. But 
That's an illusion. That's an illusion. That's a pretty compelling illusion. Okay, so I now in this case I just turn the the picture around and, and align them together, and you'll see that uh, that this image and the, and the other one is exactly the same. Exactly the same. <laughs> exactly the same. Okay, and. Uh, and your previous perception is uh, just uh, a bias, biased by the fact that you usually perceive it as a table rather than just two geometrical shapes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is about the size. Okay. And these birds are exactly the same images. Okay. Again, okay. Uh, executed by copy and paste, um, but they but they do not look exactly the same, okay, right? Okay, this one looks a little bit bigger than this one, actually a lot bigger, but not not double the size of this. Okay, do you agree? <laughs> okay, it's just just bigger. Okay, but they're actually not bigger. <laughs> okay. Um, if, if this uh, is a real scene in the beach, okay, uh, this, uh, this will be a monster bird. It's, it's probably a bird <laughs> of uh, 10 feet tall, something like that. Okay. And uh, so this, uh, this is a monster bird. The perception of this monster bird obviously has an influence uh, on your perception of the image size. Right? It's an object bias, uh, making you to perceive this image to be bigger than it physically is. And uh, here's another one about lightness. Okay, lightness. Um, does this part of the image and this part of the image look the same? Are they identical? No. This is a lot lighter. Okay, you might say, okay, are you kidding? <laughs> this part is very different. Okay. But can you believe that they are actually physically the same? I mean, in terms of the red image, okay, the part of your eye that received the, the, the light okay, from this region and this region are exactly the same. I'm sorry. Exactly the same. I can go back and forth. And, I, and, and I'm not playing some sort of magic trick. Okay? <laughs> Right. So again, it's an object bias. In this case, you perceive uh, this thing as a 3D object, and this part is in the um, is tilted a little bit uh, inward, and therefore there is a shadow, right? Okay, and uh, and so your interpretation of uh, the lightness is obviously influenced by your understanding that uh, this part is in the shaded region. Okay. Your, your, your understanding of the real thing in the world okay, influence your perception of the image properties. Okay, that's, that's the main message. Okay. All right, this is about the color. Okay. Does this patch and this patch, okay, do this patch and this patch look identical in color? Well, unless you're color blind, <laughs> Um, you will see them to be quite different, right? Okay. And if you're an artist, you're keenly aware that they are, they're different, they're different. Can you believe that, that in terms of a retinal image, they are exactly the same? In terms of a retinal image, is that is exactly the same? Okay. But you don't see your retinal image. That's the, that's, the, that's the one thing I want to emphasize. You don't see your retinal image. You see things um, that is the product of uh, Combining the retinal image and some sort of uh, understanding. Um, right? I covered everything else, leaving only these two patches. Now you'll see that they're, they're exactly the same. Okay? It's only the, under the context. When you have the context, okay, then they look different. Of course, this is something that uh, um, most of the painters know okay, um, intuitively but it can be demonstrated in the experimental 
setting like this. Here's another one. Okay. Uh, does, uh, does this lady have uh, two eyes that uh, are colored differently? <laughs> it looks like, it looks like uh, this eye is a, is a blue eye and this is uh, just uh, a gray eye. Right? But don't forget that uh, uh, this half of the face uh, is in a different context. Uh, it's, uh, it's been shined by a reddish uh, light. Yeah, and this uh, reddish context uh, makes, the, makes the physically blue eye, uh, I'm physically gray eye, look blue, bluish. Okay. Okay. Physically speaking, in terms of retinal image, this is exactly the same as this one. Okay. But, okay. But because of the object bias, in this case, okay, it's, um, it's, it's because the, of the so-called illuminant color. Okay? You, you basically, basically, your mind is, uh, is assuming that this whole part of the face uh, is uh, equally illuminated by this reddish light. And so to explain why, um, why, your, retina, why your retina is still getting this uh, grayish image of the eye, it, it, your mind has to assume that this eye must be different. This eye must, must be absorbing this uh, reddish light and only bounce <laughs> off uh, um, the more or less bluish light. And that, that's basically the interpretation of your mind. And, uh, and, and what you perceive is just this interpretation. <laughs> okay. And as a result of that, you see the blue eye rather than gray eye. Okay. So should and could artists overcome this kind of object bias? You, know, you would think, yeah, this is very important. We need to overcome this bias to be able to draw um, things in front of our eye okay, accurately, right? Makes a lot of sense. But they need not. Okay. And this, uh, this is a, a very uh, famous uh, um, uh, art historian, Gombrich, Ernst Gombrich, a British uh, art historian. Okay. And he, he wrote a very famous book called Art and Illusion, in which he, um, uh, he had this idea that representation of visual depiction involves a simulation of a digital object on a two-dimensional media with the aim of creating illusions that the artist sees and intends to be seen by the viewers. No special mode of seeing is needed other than that involved in every activity. Very radical stand. No special mode of seeing is, uh, is required. Why? Well, it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Okay, how, do you th how, how do you do an observational drawing or painting? You look at the scenes in front of you. Okay, it's three-dimensional, right? And then you paint something on a canvas. Well, it's two-dimensional. I know it's two-dimensional, but I can also see it as a representing the, the, the 3D object in the world. And uh, all I have to do to create a compelling if, uh, illusion is to compare these two representations in the world and on the canvas. And if they match sufficiently well, then my purpose is achieved. <laughs> right? I do not have to see them as image. I just they see them as, as object, and then they, and they try to match the two objects. Yeah. And there are some evidence to support this uh, um, rather philosophical stand. Okay, there are some studies to suggest that uh, artists are not actually uh, less affected by the 3D interpretations and then a non-artist. Okay. Now here's an example of an experimental study. Um, I'm sorry. So this, uh, this, uh, this shape can be perceived as a, a, a L-shaped shape, right? And, uh, but in this context, it can be perceived as, uh, as the letter L or it can be perceived as a square hiding behind another square, right? And if you perceive it as a square hiding another square, you are, you are making a 3D interpretation, 3D interpreting rather than the 2D 
okay, image interpretation. And there is a, uh, a technique in psychology to uh, assess uh, how much, um, to what degree that we perceive it as, uh, as 2D and to, to what degree you perceive it as, 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 as a 3D. Okay? And, and exact, the exact experimental paradigm is, uh, is not very important, okay? but you know, basically you ask people to perceive it as, a, as, a, as an image and to see okay, uh, how the context how the context influences the way you perceive it. Okay, there is a measure of a reaction time in the experimental paradigm called a visual search. Okay. But um, essentially what they found is that the, the degree that the people are influenced by the, by the context, I mean this context, um, is, is, uh, is almost the same, okay, whether you are an artist or non, uh, or, or, not, uh, or, or non artist. Okay, you are influenced by the context to the same extent. And uh, uh, there's also some interesting study by this uh, British uh, uh, experimental psychologist uh, uh, who analyzed the eye-hand movement patterns in observational drawings by highly accomplished uh, um, artists. Uh, like in one case, he studied uh, 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 the drawing process by, uh, by, by Matisse, okay, and using an archive uh, video um, clips, okay. Matisse drawing his nephew, okay. Matisse. Um, and he basically found that uh, Matisse and also another artist, a highly accomplished artist who has uh, work uh, represented in the uh, British National Gallery of Portrait, Portrait Gallery, okay. Ocean, I think, by the name of Ocean. Okay. So they basically found that uh, these highly accomplished artists uh, look at the models longer and less frequently than a novice painter okay, or, or drawer. Okay. And they also engage in more blind drawing. Blind drawing means uh, drawing without looking at your paper. Okay. And uh, this is the experimental data. Okay. So this is the time, this is the phase where you look at the original, or look at the model, or original, if you are doing a copy task. Okay. And this is the time you look at the paper. You see that Matisse okay, um, take a longer time. The, each time you look, look at the model, it, take, it takes a longer time. Okay, to finish okay, each time. It also takes longer time okay, to, to draw um, while looking at the paper and not, not the model. So what this suggests is uh, that uh, at, at the, okay, one, such, uh, one conclusion that we can draw from this kind of a pattern is that, uh, at, is that these artists uh, okay, um, rely a lot on their on their memory, okay, the, the schemers okay, um, in their head to draw rather than just getting the information okay, from the model or from the original. Okay. So, what does leave does this leave us? Um, so on the one hand, you have seen that, uh, um, uh, that Gombrich has a point that uh, maybe to some degree artists uh, um, do not have to see images. Okay? They just, uh, they're just comparing the 3D uh, representations on the head and, uh, and the scene. Um, but then on the other hand, okay, um, there is uh, some evidence to suggest that uh, um, that they, they, they may be seeing something in the image, but, the, the, um, um, but this, uh, this, uh, this is not very convincing. Okay. And uh, um, so what about, what about the, the original idea, the innocent eye okay, proposed by uh, John Rushkin and, uh, and Crow and, uh, and Monet? Okay. Um, could their hypothesis still stand? Okay, uh, and, and be consistent to, to some degree with, uh, with the science of a vision. Well, there are two possibilities that the, the innocent eye hypothesis could still stand. 
Uh, two, uh, two possibilities. One is that, uh, well, you don't have to assume that, uh, that everything is uh, presented uh, at your eye level and you see with your eyes. Okay. You, the only thing you have to assume is, uh, is that there is a, some kind of a sense data. So innocent eye can be a metaphor, which basically means uh, some sort of a sense data, which is uh, consciously perceived the raw sensations. Okay. And uh, according to a very influential psychologist, uh, Irvin Rock, um, you can have a modern version of this innocent hypothesis, which says that the seeing involves uh, the initial percept corresponding to the retinal image. Well, uh, you do not directly assess this retinal image. The retinal image still has to be processed. Uh, but at some level of this uh, visual information processing, it will give rise to, to a conscious uh, perception, a percept. Okay. Uh, but then, if you're not making special effort to, uh, to perceive it, then the information processing will go on uh, to give rise to the final percept, which is the object. Okay. So it's a, it's a two-percept two okay, hypothesis a modern version of the original um, innocent eye hypothesis. Essentially, it is suggested to see, a, to see an image requires the suppressing the default information processing flow and be able to assess the original percept. Does that sound reasonable? <laughs> yeah. And. Uh, and following this line of thinking, you can argue that the artist may be better at accessing the, the original percept. Okay? And they are, just, they are just very good at suppressing the normal mundane okay, mode of a seeing, seeing object. Okay? And is there any evidence to, suggest, to, to support this idea? Well, in psychology, okay, when you have an idea, you always have to have some evidence okay, to show that the, that it makes sense, right? And so uh, there are actually some studies to, to, to test this idea. Do artists really see more vertical images? Or do they have less illusions? Well, first of all, okay, there, there, are, there are different kinds of uh, different uh, strategies okay, to test uh, this uh, um, modern version of innocent hypothesis. The first um, is uh, pretty straightforward. The first strategy, strategy for testing is pretty straightforward. Okay, you just give these uh, um, classical geometric uh, optical illusions and the testing an artist and a non artist to see whether artists uh, have uh, less um, illusion okay, than non artist. Okay. And uh, many studies have been done. Okay. And uh, it is almost uh, a consensus that artists are no better than non-artists at sort of a fending off the size and the lightness illusion and also many classical geometrical optical illusions like this one that I trust that many of you know. It's called a Miller Lie illusion. It, 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 it's in many children's books. Okay. Um, so this, uh, this line and this line are physically exactly the same, but most people tend to perceive this one as longer than the, than the other one. Okay, artists are no exception. Artists also perceive this uh, <laughs> to be longer. Okay, okay, your training just does not, that, that does not matter. Okay. Uh, and here is a... Um, Another strategy to test uh, this modern version of innocent hypothesis. Okay. Um, and the strategy is to see whether, um, okay, given this kind of uh, images, okay, let's say okay, you have an image like this, and you tell the research participant that this represents the, the ring of a, a coffee cup. Okay and uh, visualize uh, yourself uh, to be sitting in a position and, and uh, view these images uh, obliquely or okay, with an angle, right? So you know that these are coffee cups and uh, uh, the 
the, the object shape uh, is, a, is a circular, is a circle rather than an ellipse, right? And, uh, uh, but in terms of the image shape, it's, it's an uh, elliptical shape, right? And, uh, um, and we all have this tendency to perceive the elliptic shape as a little bit fatter, okay? <laughs> Okay, and this line represents your perception. This, this line represents your retinal image. The, uh, this field shape represents the retinal image. Okay. Your perception of this shape tend to be biased by your understanding that, uh, that it's actually circular in 3D. Okay. Okay. And it's no different. Okay. Uh, among artists and non-artists, artists still have the same illusion. Um, still, there's the same kind of a distortion in their perception. Okay. And this is just uh, another uh, study. Okay. And this is a, okay, this, uh, this is a pretty old, okay, 1930s, and this is conducted just a few years ago. Okay. And instead of a, co a coffee cup, they, they are testing people with a door. Okay. And the door can be uh, the perfect front view or a slanted view like this one, this one. Okay, and they basically ask people to, to pick a so-called so -called comparison shape to match the target shape. And they basically found, uh, so for example, in this case, people tend to pick one uh, that, uh, that is a little bit fatter, okay, like, like, like this one instead of uh, this one to match <laughs> the shape. Okay. Um, but, Okay. This is dispu disputed by some other psychologists, or some other kind of psychologists that failed to replicate uh, Cohen and Jones. So there's some controversy. Um, as I see it, the, the most uh, productive and, uh, um, and, the, 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 um, and the most interesting piece of evidence that, that seem to be related um, to the, innocent, the, the modern version of innocent hypothesis um, is uh, provided by these guys, okay. and uh, okay, so so they basically want to see whether drawing skills are correlated with perception of a briefly presented complex curves okay, measured by copy and uh, a visual search task, which I will not get into detail. Okay. Um, Essentially, they, they created a bunch of uh, uh, complex uh, organic shaped curves so with, a com with an algorithm called a Fourier synthesis. Okay. And uh, you can manipulate the, uh, the, the complexity of these shapes in a very quantitative way. Okay. Um, you can say uh, that, uh, well, this one is uh, okay. it's in terms of harmonics. Right? Uh, so these, these shapes are supposedly more complex than these ones. Okay. Anyway, okay, they basically found that uh, uh, artists tend to, um, tend to have a better sensory memory, okay, sensory memory of uh, these complex shapes. So good news, okay. artists have some advantage. <laughs> um, But even in this case, I would argue that uh, it cannot be cited as, as evidence uh, that, uh, uh, that artists just see things uh, more, uh, in, in more veridical terms uh, than an artist. Because you can argue that artists have, uh, have experienced uh, similar shapes like this uh, a lot more than an artist. Most artists have experienced uh, drawing human figures, trees, and a lot of these uh, shapes are organic. Okay, complex. Okay, while well, non-artists, uh, especially uh, guys living in the city, okay, see a lot of uh, straight lines, uh, skylines. Uh, st <laughs> okay, and so maybe artists have uh, have uh, have uh, a, a a greater pool of uh, schemata uh, or mental templates of these organic shapes, uh, making them uh, more efficient in. Um, in memorizing or retrieving these complex shapes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, by the way, they also found okay, that drawing skills 
join scales are not correlated with the accuracy of a circle join. This is, this is okay, so let, okay, suppose you're, okay, you're, you're asked okay, to draw a perfect circle. Okay, how, how well you, do you think you can do it? <laughs> right? Everyone else have a perfect idea of what a perfect circle is, but still, okay, there's a huge difference, individual difference in how well you can draw a perfect circle. Okay? And it's mainly a matter of a motor skill, I would say. And, uh, um, and they basically showed that the motor skill, this at least measured um, by um, circle drawing, is not correlated with your, with your drawing skills. Okay? So suggesting that the motor skill is probably not very important. So at this point, we, we have to make a, 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 a distinction between the so-called illusion and the delusions. Illusions is basically the kind of things that I have demonstrated, like to the degree that you perceive uh, uh, this uh, to be longer than this one. Okay? That's an illusion. Illusion, right? It's, it's in your mind. It's, it's, it's your perception. Okay? And uh, it's misperception that cannot be reduced by an act of a will. Even you know that, that there's going to be an illusion, okay, you still cannot help okay, forming the illusion. <laughs> okay. The illusion just cannot be resisted by, by your conscious will. Okay. Um, on the other hand, okay, what is delusion? I, I put a quotation mark on, on delusion. It's not the kind of a delusion that we talked about in, in, in psychopathology. <laughs> okay. um, it's just uh, the false belief that that are held in spite of uh, invalidating evidence. Okay, in this case, for example, if you, uh, if, uh, if you think that okay, watching this one okay, gives you a, uh, a, leads you to perceive a rectangular shape rather than a trapezoid shape, then you are deluded. <laughs> It's trapezoid. It's not rectangular. <laughs> You're deluded. <laughs> so there has been no convincing evidence for less illusion, but some evidence for reduced delusions in artists who can show more accurately. Okay? Now, actually, um, there is some theoretical or meta-theoretical reasons why illusion just does not matter. Even if, even if artists have less illusions, it still does, ma does not matter um, in terms of its importance in, um, in drawing and the painting. Okay. Why? Well, the first reason is that uh, reduced illusions could not possibly account for more vertical de depiction because the illusion of the original, like the model and the scene, would be canceled by the illusion of the, depic um, the depiction of uh, depiction, I mean the picture on the canvas or paper. Right? So you will have the same kind of illusions uh, of the model and also the image on the canvas. And they will cancel each other out. This is the so-called algorithmic fallacy. <laughs> it is used. It, it used to be thought that uh, uh, that it is uh, oddly elongated figures okay, by the famous uh, Spanish painter Algarico, um is due to some sort of unusual uh, eye pathology, a uh, unusual form uh, of astigmatism, okay, which makes Algarico to perceive everything to be elongated. <laughs> okay. um, but this explanation cannot be true, because if it's true, then El Greco would also perceive the whole canvas to be stretched out. Okay. So it will cancel each other out. Okay. Right? <laughs> A second reason why illusion does not matter, if delusion might matter, illusion does not matter, is uh, that you have to take a neuroscience perspective of the matter. What neuroscience of a visual system tells us is that uh, 
um, that visual processing does not proceed in a sort of uh, one-way traffic of information processing from retinal image to to bring representation of the of the image. It actually proceeds two ways. Uh, there is a massive uh, so-called feedback connections in the visual system that. I'm sorry. That, that, that makes the concept of, of the so-called sense data or innocent eye impossible. I, I, I'm sorry, I dropped the word impossible. <laughs> that should be a word impossible. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, so think about it, this as a, as a, a retinal image. It has to, uh, it, the, the image, okay, the signals uh, has to be transmitted to somewhere in your visual system that form a low level re representation and then the mid level representation basically the surface and then okay, the high level representation the object representation uh, but uh, but this is a little bit simplified because uh, there are also these uh, feedback connections from relatively high levels of the system to lower levels of the, of the system um, so what the, what these uh, feedback connections are doing, according to the consensus of, uh, uh, of vision science, is that, uh, um, that, that they, they form a sort of expectations of what you need to see. And that this expectation is not necessarily conscious expectation. It could be unconscious expectation. It's just based on your previous experience. Or in some cases, it's not just from your previous experience. It's just something built in in your system. But anyway, it's not just things in front of your eye. It's something that's already in your head before you open your eye. Okay. So it's just very difficult. The, 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 the bottom line is just very difficult to see that there is anything that we can call raw sensations that are exclusively coming from the environment and not affected by what's in your system already before you open, you open your eye. Okay, there is just no such thing conceivable as raw sensation okay, or sense data. And, and the third reason that, uh, uh, that, that the idea of a sense data or raw sensation is implausible um, is provided by uh, Gestalt psychologists, who are mainly German psychologists, okay, emigrated to this country in the, in the 1940s and the, uh, and the 50s. So according to these psychologists, by the way, Gestalt psychologists is still very influential, even in the contem contemporary scene of a visual science. Okay. Um, their main idea okay, is that uh, the whole, or what you perceive, is more than the sum of its parts. Okay? The perception is more than the sum of its parts. And the second, the sensation is the product of analysis on perception rather uh, and occur after perception. Sensation does not, it's not, the, uh, it's not something that, that occurred before perception, rather it's just the product of analysis. Okay? Does that make any sense? Well, um, look at this figure. Okay, the famous Kinesia triangle. Um, then you ask you this: so when you, okay, you can close your eye and then you open your eye, okay, what what do you see? In your, uh, what's your first impression of this thing? A triangle. <laughs> this triangle. Okay. Um, this, but the triangle is not defined by lines. There's no three lines. It's just a bunch of. Uh, um, components uh, which may or may not have uh, something to do with a uh, triangle, right? It's just that in this particular configuration, you see a triangle. And a triangle is just something okay, that pops up in your mind. And according to Gestalt psychologist, is that before you open your eye, okay, you already have a sort of a mental field okay, that predisposes you to, to see something meaningful. And when you receive these uh, sensations, these sensations automatically get configured <laughs> into 
the percept that you call triangle. And then you can analyze this triangle and to say, well, these are the components uh, of a triangle. Okay? These are the raw sensations that made triangle possible. But that's just the afterthought. <laughs> so is it possible to conceive a sort of a innocent hypothesis without the idea of raw sensation or sense data? Well, I think it's still possible. <laughs> okay. um, without the pre-assumption of a sense data or initial percept, as uh, Urban Locke tells us, it, it's still possible to conceive a special mode of a seeing, a proximal mode, uh, what I call the proximal mode of, uh, of a seeing things. Why, why, why it's called a proximal? Well, um, it, it's a special terminology. A proximal image uh, is the same thing as a retinal image. So you can call this a retinal mode of seeing things. Okay? It's, it's the same thing. But we know that we, we, do see, see, we don't see retinal images okay? uh, directly. Okay? Retinal image has to, okay, to be, ha has to arise somewhere in your head. But anyway, um, this mode of seeing is characterized by its concern with pictorial relationships, pictorial relationships, proportion, perspective, luminous contrast, the color contrast, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, um, and the second property is that it's view and the perspective uh, dependent. Okay. It depends on where you stand, where you look at things, and, uh, and the illumination in the environment. Okay. And the third, that um, it's anything but innocent. <laughs> Anything but innocent. Okay. It is effortful, learned, and conscious, at least initially. Okay. If you become sufficiently proficient, it, it might get automatized a little bit, but at least initially, it's very effortful. Okay. So it's a very different kind of a concept of innocent eye. It's not really innocent eye. It's just uh, <laughs> image okay, mode of seeing things. Huh? And uh, it's, uh, every artist knows that it's, uh, it's facilitated by all kinds of uh, tricks, like a monocular cane, like you, you can cover your w one eye and see things just with one eye, like monocular, monocular viewing. Okay? That will make things uh, flatter, okay? and that will facilitate uh, uh, proximal mode of seeing. And squinting, okay, that makes things blurred a little bit, and you see shapes better. Okay, using a mirror measurement with a stick or plump. Okay. Um, interestingly, okay, there are some pathological conditions of the eye which facilitate um, seeing with uh, the proximal mode. Okay. The, uh, a neuroscientist in uh, Harvard Medical School, Livingstone, found that uh, through the analysis of uh, a series of paintings uh, con uh, executed uh, by Rembrandt, and uh, she, she reached the conclusion that uh, Rembrandt actually suffered from strabismus uh, that makes him see things flatter. <laughs> uh, anyway, proximal mode of seeing in observation uh, depiction is very important to the extent that artists have to be constantly aware of the pictorial relationship between focused visual image and others in the periphery. Okay, the proximal mode of seeing is needed in all stages of visual depiction, but it's particularly important in the initial so-called blocking stage, where the main concern is getting the 2D pictorial relationships correct. So this is something that I get from uh, the internet, a, a, a painting demo by a British uh, um, painter, Andrew um, James. You see that, uh, that it's very important in the initial stage to, to try very hard to get the proportions correct and also making sure, for example, the nose uh, uh, is uh, in this particular position, that uh, this uh, corner of the eye is not sticking out to here, something like that, right? Okay. It's all about the pictorial relationship. Um, and uh, at, ne okay, at the next stage, okay, you, you, you have to okay, make sure that, uh, uh, that the, these color tones, 
this, I'm sorry, color tones are correct. Okay? It's all about, it's all relative. In other words, the keyword is a relative. You, you have to make these relationships, relationships either in terms of a form and a color correct. And that's, the, that's not the concern of uh, uh, seeing uh, in the so-called distal mode, okay, the, the, the Monday everyday mode of seeing. Okay. Um, Uh, interestingly, when you think about it, uh, this, uh, this way of uh, seeing things, a special way of uh, seeing things, an effortable way of uh, seeing things, does not uh, uh, develop naturally. Okay, there is some evidence to suggest that, uh, um, um, uh, that, that the very young children okay, uh, just cannot do this because they have difficulty okay, uh, taking visual perspectives. Okay, this perspective is a, is a, is a is a very difficult thing for, for children. Okay? And, uh, and there is also some suggestion that, uh, uh, that, this, that, that this special mode of uh, seeing things, a proximal mode, uh, is uh, correlated with the capacity of uh, forming mental images. Mental images. Okay? Some studies have suggested that, by, um, that, that we can trace to Piaget's work, a, a very influential developmental psychologist. Okay, I will not get into details because of the time. Okay. Um, anyway, look at these children's uh, paintings. <laughs> Do they look veridical? Okay. Definitely not. Okay. It's all very conceptual, schematized. Okay. So, all right, okay. it takes time. For, the, for, the, for this special skill of a seeing pictorial relationship to develop. Okay. So, okay, so, so here is, a, is my model. Okay. This is a, something um, that I proposed okay. <laughs> um, just recently. Okay. There's, a, there's a sort of a dual model. Um, okay, that you have to conceive a dual model theory of a seeing in, in visual depiction. The proximal mode okay, is a perspective and a view centered. On the other hand, okay, the distal mode of a scene is a perspective or object centered. Both are, both, both are necessary and, uh, and important, but, um, but we, we have to pay particular attention to the proximal mode. The okay, proximal mode is concerned with pictorial relationship, okay, all these things I have already talked about. Distal mode is mainly concerned with the 3D, 3D shapes and the meanings. Okay. And I should also add that uh, but it's not just about seeing, it's also about uh, emotional engagement. Okay? Oh, even, even when you see just the, the pictorial relationship, you still have an, an emotional reaction to the relationship. Okay? It is, so it involves emotional engagement with the formal and the design aspects of the picture. In contrast, the other distal mode of a scene okay, involves emotional and motivational engagement with the depicted object, okay? not the image. So oh, that's, uh, that's my graphic representation okay, of a model. Okay, so you have uh, the retinal image, okay, and then you, then you also have this top-down okay, schema goal-related um, mode of a seeing. Okay, and, uh, um, and it's the combination of this uh, so-called top-down and the bottom-up process um, visual experience arises. Okay. And uh, I would argue that when you're seeing things in the proximal mode, you at the same time inhibit the other mode or vice versa. Okay. Whether they can also facilitate with each other is something we really don't know. Okay. It's uh, another possibility. And there are all sorts of procedures to, to, to promote uh, or facilitate the proximal model of seeing, for example, drawing negative space, something that uh, is uh, very much emphasized in the famous book, uh, Drawing on the Right Side of Your Brain by Betty Edwards. Okay. Um, and then, okay, up, down, down, inverted drawing, like drawing. Yeah. So Picasso's original portrait, is, and this is a beginning student, it's so inverted the copy. And you see, it's not, not too bad. Okay. 
And the whole purpose of inverted join is the, uh, that when it's inverted, you tend to see less of the meaning of 3D shape. You, you tend to see just the, the pictorial relationship. And that's why it works, right? But on the other hand, there are also procedures and the studies that promote the digital mode of, uh, I'm sorry, digital mode of seeing. For example, obviously, artists all know that you, you, need to, uh, you need to study anatomy of human figures and even anatomy of trees okay, to be able to draw accurately the human figures and uh, the, the morphologies and the shapes of the trees. Okay. That's, that's all drawing. Okay, drawing what one knows, okay, drawing based on knowledge. Okay. Um, I found that this, uh, um, because uh, of my obsession with, uh, with the painting and the drawing for the last few years, <laughs> I have a, a lot of art instruction books. And I found that these art instruction books can be classified into two categories, okay. uh, some of which promote a proximal mode of a C, okay, like these two, at least three, okay, artist's brain, okay. Showing on the right side of the brain, it's all promote the proximal mode of seeing. And then there's another typically, okay, okay, I'll let, let me hold this a little moment, okay. Um, uh, I should also get just a few words about, about this uh, particular way of uh, instruction. Uh, it does not necessary that uh, that you need to do a lot of this exercise uh, to get a sense uh, uh, to 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 get proficient to get uh, uh, to get a proficient in seeing pictorial relationship. According to some um, art teachers, okay, um, it's just a way of getting into a mode of seeing that uh, that you already know more or less. Okay? It's just that. It gives you the idea that you, you, you need to see things in this special way. Okay. Um, okay. On the other hand, there, there are also um, instruction books that promote what I call the distal mode of seeing, okay, seeing based on understanding, seeing based on the knowledge of what things actually look like in 3D space. Okay. The classical book will be this one. Okay. Uh, by Bridgman, and there are also books on how to draw trees, <laughs> anatomy of trees. And uh, this is uh, a book uh, from 1940s, uh, which uh, was um, very influential, I guess, in the old days. Okay. Um, it emphasized uh, uh, not just the visual information, but, uh, but also okay, other information, like uh, touch, tactile, sense. Okay. The whole point is that you need to incorporate a lot of information to get sense of the object to be able to draw it um, um, accurately. Okay. And uh, this is this is a, uh, one artist that I uh, admire a lot, okay, Henry uh, Robert Henry. And uh, he, according to him, drawing is not following a line of a model. It is a drawing your sense of the things. So that's basically a, uh, a, a way to say that you need to draw based on understanding. Okay, um, okay so I'm not going to, okay, basically the same thing. Okay. Uh, the last issue that I'm going to talk about is uh, um, the, the, the neurophysiological Mechanism, brain mechanisms for the, for the proximal mode of a seeing. Okay. Betty Edwards famously said that, uh, um, that seeing image is a function of the right brain, the right hemisphere. And I would say that that's probably wrong. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so his, uh, her idea is uh, left brain is a logical and a verbal, right brain is uh, intuitive and, a ver uh, and visual. And the learning to draw involves the releasing from the hegemony of the left brain, right? so to speak. I'm, I'm simplifying things a little bit, okay? but that's the main idea. Okay? Um, but there is really little evidence to support this idea. Okay? On the other hand, uh, recent neuroimaging studies and the neuropsychological studies suggest that both the left brain and the right brain are likely involved in the proximal mode of seeing. 
Yeah, seeing image depends definitely on both the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, both. Okay. And I will get, not get into details of this. So there, there are a lot of studies. Okay. Um, and I would also suggest that, uh, and uh, as far as I know, that there, there's, pop, there's uh, no study that has been done uh, on this issue. Okay. It's probably also crucially uh, dependent on the brain areas involved in perspective taking, as well as uh, generating a sense of agency or self in action, because uh, this is related to the fact that the proximal way of seeing depends on your sense that you're looking at things from a particular perspective and angle. Okay? And you're very consciously aware, actually, when you're doing this. Okay? And so it may depend on okay, some brain areas uh, that, that is involved in this uh, self-consciousness of perspective taking. Okay? Um, I would say there is a special exceptional case, which is uh, uh, some autistic savant, you know, and many of them are children, seem to draw very differently. Um, and these people are exceptionally good at the visual depiction spell, but, uh, uh, but below average abilities in other domains, so their IQ can be pretty low. Okay? Uh, like uh, this guy, Stephen, I'm uh, sorry, Stephen Wisher, uh, he can draw a very complex uh, cityscape uh, and just portion by portion as if uh, reading off uh, his uh, mind map. Okay? It's very amazing. Okay? And I would say that's an exception. I cannot explain it in terms of the effort for proximal mode of a C. Okay. Probably their brain are wired, wired differently. <laughs> okay. um, this modes of a scene definitely in, uh, uh, influence the depiction styles. And I would, uh, okay, this, this is a little bit speculative and not pure science. But I would say that this, uh, this kind of a painting is a pre probably the result of predominantly proximal motor seeing. It seems like the artist um, is mainly concerned with the color contrast uh, and, uh, and the proportions and, and the design aspect of the picture. Okay. And so is this one. Okay. On the other hand, okay, um, you look at these pictures, uh, they are not um, very accurate in terms of a proportion, a f exact physiognomy of uh, the model that you're depicting, but they give you a very deep sense of uh, what these persons are. Okay, there is a psychological depth to it. And by the way, this is uh, by the, uh, uh, Lucien Freud, who is uh, the grand grandson of Sigmund Freud, the famous <laughs> psychoanalyst. Okay. Um, and I would say that uh, this is probably okay. Quintessentially distal mode of a C. Okay. And uh, so is this the guy, I, uh, artist uh, Robert Henry, I, I admire a lot. Okay. Seems like there's a superb mix of a proximal and a distal mode of seeing. Proportions are correct, colors are exaggerated, but in a very good way. Okay. In, the good, in a very good way, so that you, you appreciate the identity of these uh, models. Okay. They give you you, you even feel spiritual <laughs> when you look at these, uh, these, uh, these figures. Yeah. Okay. And I should also say that it is not limited to, to figures. It, still life, can, you can even draw still life with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the distal mode. Okay. This is uh, by the famous Italian uh, painter, okay, Morandi. Okay. And uh, do you feel spiritual? <laughs> Meaningful, <laughs> looking at these uh, uh, bottles, right? It gives you a sense, okay. And I, I guess uh, uh, when he, I can, I can only imagine like, when he's doing these paintings, he's not just concerned with proportions and the colors. He, he really tried to see the identities of these bottles. <laughs> All right, so the, the last part okay, um, of this talk is, uh, I think, the, uh, although I'm talking about the, the, the perceptual mode in visual depiction, uh, but I think it also has implications in, um, in just looking at the things by everyone, okay, even, even if you're not an artist. Okay. Yeah. 
So my main point is that beauty can be discovered by, by both the proximal and the distal mode of a scene. Right? Um, uh, well, you can, you can adopt a predominantly distal mode of a seeing things. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, this predominantly distal mode you know, seeing things like when you look at this picture, okay, you see the God of liberty, <laughs> okay, and you are not so care about the, the the compositions and the designs and the colors. You just okay, it's spiritual. It's, a, it's God of liberty, okay, um, and then also you can see things uh, in a in a proximal mode. In a, for example, okay, this is a p oh, example, <laughs> okay. Um, by a French okay, or Swiss avant-garde painter, and okay, this is a French and sonne you know, peep, and basically means okay, this is not a pipe. Well, how come it is not a pipe? Well, <laughs> it's just a picture of a pipe. It's a representation of a pipe, tobacco pipe, right? And so okay, this caption basically induces you to see things in the proximal mode, right? This is a picture by myself, my son, seven year old, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's very decorative. Okay, it's uh, it's not very realistic. Okay, it's uh, okay. Um, Jim would say it's it's, a, it's, it's almost like a, a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> but you can also okay, see it in a distal mode, and uh, okay, like me. Okay, and it's, uh, since it's it's my son, okay, I. I definitely have the, have the emotional connection when seeing this, okay? and then when I'm doing this, uh, watching this picture, okay, I'm, I'm doing the distal mode of seeing. <laughs> okay. So you go around in your environment, and I want to say that uh, some of the scenes are sort of a pre-packaged beauty and are meant to be seen. Okay. This is this architecture, okay? and. Uh, it's all very well designed, and uh, whichever angle you are looking at it, it's pretty. Okay. Um, so in a sense, okay, you're, you're already pre-proposed, pre-predispositioned to see these uh, man-made structures in the proximal mode. Right? But other things like this and this, okay, you have to discover. <laughs> okay. You just have to adopt, consciously adopt this special mode of a scene to discover the beauty of it. Okay. Is this pretty or not? It's hard to say. <laughs> it's hard to say. But if you adopt this special mode of a scene, you will discover the beauty of these very mundane things. Okay. And finally, okay. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, some are meant to be seen just by the few with artful eyes and the brain okay, in the proximal mode. Okay. So you see these things uh, everywhere. You go to an art fair or whatever, art prize. Uh, people uh, pass by you, and uh, you can take a snapshot. But if you're not taking a snapshot, but you just look at things in your eye, you can also discover the beauty, and not necessarily the beauty of this girl. Uh, I mean, if you know this girl, you, you, will, you will see it in the distal mode. But even if it's a complete stranger, um, you'll still discover the beauty because of uh, the pictorial relationships in the scene. Okay? Okay? The, the contrast between, between the black area and, the, and the, this area and the, and the, the interesting form. Okay? Contrast between this and this. Okay, you just have to train yourself to see in the artful eye. Okay, and uh, and my term for the artful eye is just the proximal mode of seeing. Okay. So okay, okay that is uh, the summary or highlights of my talk. Okay, there's a little evidence that the artists see more vertical or less illusory images than the artist. Artist's perceptual advantage in observational depiction lies mostly, most plausibly in their capacity to distinguish between image attributes and object attributes. And the second, or third, observational painting and the drawing involve interplays of uh, two different modes of a scene, the distal mode and the proximal mode. Both modes of a scene are goal and schema, schemata driven. 
Um, the distal model scene is concerned with uh, 3D shapes and the meaning of objects, while it is uh, the default of mode of a scene in everyday non aesthetic act activities. The distal mode of a scene can be enhanced by understanding the structure of the types of objects to be depicted, like a human figure and the trees. Okay. And the proximal mode of a scene is concerned with the pictorial relationships among the visual elements to be depicted. While it is not exclusively found in art production and the viewing, its development depends on art instruction and the practice. And these two modes of a scene are also implicated in artful looking, whether at drawing or paintings of mundane scenes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah.